Thank you all for coming. Really appreciate you being here for this day. Uh, my name is Mark Guglielmo, and I'm joined today by Wilson Valentin Escobar, a good old friend who is a professor of American Studies and Sociology at Hampshire College. And he is someone that I was really excited to do this with because of everyone I've ever talked to about this work. He seems to get it the most, and the way he talks about it really inspired me in a way that I felt like he's the perfect person to do this with. So thank you for coming, and with that, we will begin. We're going to do some questions at the end, so he and I will just talk for maybe 40 minutes or so, and then we'll have 20 minutes of questions and informal conversation style. So good evening. Uh, thanks for having us here. Uh, thanks also to TEDx Deerfield. Uh, for welcoming us and for putting this together. Um, so like I said, Mark said, um, uh, my name is Wilson Valentin Escobar. I'm a professor and curator, and um, I find Mark's work very provocative um, in many ways. Um, obviously, my, my expertise is dealing with Latino artists in New York City, as well as what's going on in the Caribbean, and obviously, Cuba, in this context, is included in that. Um, so um, I wanted to basically begin uh, with, um, you know, where we we'll often begin is like, obviously, we're both New Yorkers. Um, and I think it's a good, that's a good place to begin, sort of provide that context. You know, art is always informed by social processes in addition to our individual ideas, right? There's a, there's a complex process, a mix, mm -hmm. between sort of the individual with that social setting. Right. So um, I was wondering if we can begin there. And so how did New York City, did New York City inform your artistic vision, um, sort of this global landscape of, of, of New York? And if so, like, how, how did that inform your, your artistic sensibility? I mean, it definitely did. And I can think of, like, when I look at this piece, I see the energy of it. And for me, that kind of, like, it reminds me of New York City and, and, and the energy that's in New York and the aliveness of New York and, and sometimes the craziness of New York. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the other thing I think about is um, kind of New York of the 70s and, and 80s when I was growing up there and, and that era of New York. And so, um, you know, growing up in New York, you, you Puerto Ricans are such a big part of the history of New York. And so we lived up in uh, Hastings on Hudson by Yonkers, but we would go into the city all the time and my uh, extended family lived in Queens. And so we kind of traipsed all through the boroughs growing up and you got a sense for the different cultures and foods and musics and, you know, language. And so, um, I definitely can see, you know, not consciously, but subconsciously where, where that kind of can come from. Just choosing this medium for me was about trying to bring more life into photography. I had gotten bored of the two-dimensional, there's an image, you look at it, it's just, I just wanted, I wanted to try to express how I felt when I was in Cuba using photographic means, and this was the way that I feel like I could possibly kind of hint at that. So um, for those of us in the know, uh, know that you were first a musician, um, and then you entered photography. So uh, what, what brought you into photography? Why photography uh, first, and, and why Cuba? I mean, photography, I fell in love with photography in, in high school in the mid-80s. So it was a time when cameras weren't as ubiquitous as they are now. Everybody has a camera now. And so, at least, you know, in our culture here, if you have a phone, you have a camera. And so people, almost everybody's a photographer now. Back then, it wasn't like that. It was sort of, uh, you needed to go get a camera and, and buy it, even if it was a Polaroid or a or a, uh, an Instamatic, or, 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 a digital, or an SLR, I mean, a, a film camera. You had to actually be into it and, and try it out yourself. And, it, and so in high school, I had a, an amazing teacher who 
uh, kind of unlocked the magic of photography for me. And she put a dark room in our high school, which was very rare for a public school at the time. Mm -hmm. And she had a unique ability to kind of let each of us find our own voice and, and kind of give us everything we would need to either fall in love with it, try to have fun with it, or maybe it wasn't for you. But so there was something about photography where I think that the magic part of when you take a picture and you had it on film on the negative and then you develop it and then you put it in the liquid and you don't know what's going to happen and then out of darkness, plus you're in a dark room and you're looking out in this purple light in this liquid and all of a sudden this image emerges. There was something really magical about that. You didn't know if you had a good image when you took a picture. You might have a feeling that I think something good might have come out of that role or something, but it wasn't until you went in there and saw the thing emerge out of darkness that, that you, you had something or not. It was, it was one part of my life where I could like, get into that magic, where, where beauty and magic kind of came together for me. Mm -hmm. Aside from that magic, right, photography is a science, right? And it's a science based on inversions and contrasts. So if you're looking at a negative, what's light is dark when it's printed, so on and so forth. And then also the image is inverted, right? And that's part of the science, you know, of, of photography. Now with that, too, with that level of inversion, um, there's also this idea of not only simply looking outward, right, but there's also an inversion of right. looking inward. Right. So I'm wondering whether whether there's a parallel between the science of photography also informs the artistry and whether in this case is some of what we're witnessing here right. a reflection of who you are. Yeah. Do we see Marco Guglielmo in, in this? Yeah, I mean, I feel like you do. I mean, I feel like at that age, I was a teenager at the time and I was trying to find out who I was that process, I guess, never ends while we're alive. We're still learning about who we are and sort of tapping into these limitless aspects while meeting the limits. And so photography was another way for me to try to see myself at that age and during that time. And uh, I was telling you before, I was talking to uh, Heshima Moya, who's a, a percussionist, um, and he, I had interviewed him after he saw this show about a year ago. And he was like, you know, Cuban transition as a name for an exhibit, it's not really about that. It's really about Mark in transition. Yeah. You know, he's like, Cuba's been there forever. I mean, as long as the earth has been here, Cuba has been there. And so everything's always changing. So he's like, it's really about Mark in transition. And I was like, huh. <laughs> so it got me thinking about it. And I was like, he's right. Because when I went to Cuba, I had just broken up with my fiance. And I was like heartbroken, you know, after your breakup and you're like trying to put your life back together. You don't know up or down. You don't know who you are anymore. The, just the choices and decisions you were making and when you're building a life together, all of a sudden you're just building your life by yourself. And so when I went there, I was kind of, I was really open and, and going through great change in my own life. And so I found something down there. The other thing was that and I was telling you before, I tapped into a feeling I got when I was going to my grandma's house as a kid. It was like when you turned the corner and got onto her street, it was like you were arriving at heaven, you know? And, and so we would scream like, Grandma Street, you know, the first person to say that because we were so happy to just be in her home with my grandfather. And the love that they created, I kind of like tapped into that in Cuba. You know, and it was through this guy I met playing a gig on the, the top floor of the hotel I was staying at. He came over to talk to me during, in between one of his sets. And, and I was telling him I'm from New York, I'm Italian American. He's like, oh my God, you gotta meet my son. And his son, it turns out, had moved to Italy. He was a Santiago from Santiago de Cuba, and he had lived for the past 15 years in Italy. So he came over, we started talking. At that time, I talked more Italian than I spoke Spanish, so I was talking Spanish with a lot of Italian. But he could understand me perfect, so I was like, <laughs> this guy's the right guy to talk to. <laughs> but anyway, he's like, well, what do you want to do while you're here in, in, in Cuba? And I was like, I really want to see how you guys actually live. I don't want to have this tourist experience. I want the real deal. And he's like, well, you should just come hang out with me and my family. I was like. 
that sounds great. So the next day, he and his dad and his dad's girlfriend came to the hotel, and we, we walked to his house, and we hung out a bunch of times after that. And they just, they welcomed me in like I was one of their sons. It was like, and it made me feel like I felt when, we, when gra my grandmother was alive, and she died in 2010. And so it had been five or six years since she passed away. And they had sold her house and paved over her garden. And so there was like, a, the, the, between 2010 and 2015 when I went to Cuba, it was, a, it was a period of creating what she had given to us ourselves. You know, taking what she had taught us how to love, how to create love, how to create family. And now, okay, now you got to do it yourself. And so this is the, I just fell in love with Cuba. And this is what I, this is what came out of me when I was like, I really, I had a message that came, it was like clear as day. I was exhausted on the second to last day of my first trip there. And I was just meditating on how profound my experience was in Cuba. And, and, and then this, this little message came to me, share this with the world, like very subtly, just share how you're feeling about Cuba, about this experience, just share that with the world. Mm -hmm. And I was like, really? And it was like, yeah, you should sh share that with the world. And I was like, well, if I'm going to share this, I'm going to do these collages, and I want to do interviews just to have Cubans be able to speak uh, honestly and openly about their lives, about the challenges of, of living in Cuba, about what they love, about what they thought about the changing relationship with the US, things that we don't hear here, things that we don't know. It's so rare that in America, you get an honest, open perspective from the people of Cuba. Mm -hmm. It's always translated and twisted and rephrased by mass media or, and so this is, this is kind of like my own self-assigned documentary project. Mm. That's a long answer to, I no, don't know That's good, why. that's good. And I, I kind of, I mean, in, in based upon what you said, um, is it correct to say that that these photo mosaics are, in a way, articulating a new sense of home? Is that, Definitely. Is that I mean, you know, Cuba, I remember the first time I went to Italy, there was a, a feeling I got in my bones, like, oh, I've been here before. You know, even though it was the first time in this, in this lifetime when I went there, the second I stepped on the soil, it was like my body was like, oh. And Cuba has, I have a feeling there that I feel like I'm at home. I feel ho at home there. Mm -hmm. You know, the third trip I went by myself. And uh, yeah, I had fear about it, you know, because, you know, my Spanish, I can communicate. But, you know, if you get in trouble in Cuba and you're by yourself, it's not like the embassy is going to be any help. And, and what I realized was that and I had a conversation with, a, with an elderly Cuban man. He's like, if you fell down in the street and collapsed in the street, or you had no money, someone's going to help you. And my, a couple of our uncles are, were cops in New York City, and they told us this story about someone dropping dead in Manhattan and people walking right over them. And so I always remember, like, any time I go to Cuba, I'm, I feel like, I'm okay, no matter what. Yeah, people, there's hustlers everywhere, you know? That's just the reality of life on Earth. But there's a, there's a feeling there that I get that just, it feels like home. Mm. Yeah, it does. Mm. That's cool. Um, so what I, I'm seeing here is, uh, I think, th three processes or three stages of art. Uh, first is, you know, you taking pictures, capturing moments in time, moments in history. Um, then piecing things together, that would be the second. And then the third would be how we interpret this, our interaction, which is part of the artistic process, right? Yeah. Um, t can you tell us about the first two um, and your process as you're, as you're taking pictures, holding the camera, um, and then also just sitting down and, and engaging in the process of, of, of a collage. Yeah, I mean, for me, this art is very intuitive. It's, it's not a plan. I have, 
You know, these pieces, none of them are planned. You know, they're all spontaneous. And it's not like I go out with my camera when I'm in Cuba and I'm like, oh, I gotta do that and I gotta do that. I'm taking all the pictures. You just, you barely ever see me with a camera. It's only when I'm out and about and I do have my camera and I get a specific, like, very clear message, you need to do a piece of that. And I'm like, okay, all right. And then I take the camera out. And like, for instance, this piece, I was, that took about an hour and a half to photograph. And so some people have seen my work and seen, oh, you took one picture, you blew it up real big, and then you cut it up and you tape it back together. No, it's the opposite. It's each little piece is a four by six inch photograph that I use a telephoto lens to get up close on something. And then I, I move and the camera moves. And so the reason why they don't look like one picture, even though when you look at them, there's a harmony that says, oh, that's one image there's a life coming at you that's like each square is its own perspective. And that's part of what I, I like about shooting them because you know, if you look at this piece, you'll notice people are duplicated. You know, the dancer there, I put them both twice because they were moving a lot. And I wanted you to get a sense for how they were, what it was like to be there. And you, you might not be able to tell from this piece, but for instance, I'm standing about two, three feet from the, the guy in the yellow shirt. So I'm in the experience and they see me, you know, like halfway through shooting this, the guy in the yellow shirt was like, oh, you, you, you gotta make some kind of donation here. You're taking all those pictures. And I was like, you're right, you're right. I'm, I'm gonna have to hook you up, I'm gonna hook you up. And so, um, the photographing is almost, it's almost like recording. It's almost like recording someone talking a long interview and then you're just pulling out little pieces that you like. You know, I might shoot two or three times as, mis, as many photographs as I need. And then when I get them developed, I don't alter them. I don't play with the computer, adjust them. I just develop them. I don't use the light meter on my camera. I just, I shoot, I just shoot. And so it's sort of an anti-technique. Uh, it's like do, almost do, my technique is like devoid of what you would learn in school. You know, they would say you need a correct lighting, and correct lighting on my pieces don't look right because it's the contrast that you see from one piece of sky that's dark and one piece of sky that's light, which is about the camera moving and the light, the automatic light meter catching the light. Mm -hmm. And so when I'm sitting in the studio. I remember that experience and I kind of, it's, it's memory now because I built that, I build them months after I shoot them. And so when I'm putting the pieces together, I start in, on the minute level. Like I started with the, the yellow shirt guy there and build it out. But as it, as it comes together and I'm working on it, it's all intuitive in terms of where to go with it, what to make it look like. You know, this piece on the school, there is an atrium in that school where it's open to the sky. So I knew I wanted to invoke that so you could have a sense of what it's like to be in that space for the morning assembly with the kids. But then when you're actually building it, it presents all kind of other issues and problems, you know? So like, how do you make this make sense? You know, if you, if you cram the roof right above the kids, the piece is like this tall and, it doesn't really give you a sense of what the school is like, and I wanted you to see the kids, but I also wanted you to see classrooms and a teacher and the woman who's mopping the, the, the floor. Like, how often do you see her portrayed in a piece that's about the school? And so that was a quiet moment when all the kids left the atrium. Well, here's this woman who's now doing, doing the work to keep this community afloat. So it gives me an opportunity to kind of like have free creative license to, to paint with pictures however it feels right. And so that second step, it's really, it's, it's almost like the, the taking of the pictures is very free and, 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 and intuitive and just go wherever it feels right. If I go into a direction that doesn't feel right, when I'm putting these together, I'm using little pieces of tape, scotch tape on the, on the tops, just to connect them composition wise. As they start to get big and I like the composition, I turn them over and I tape them with an archival tape on the back then I'll turn it back over, keep working, and then when it's finished, I peel all the tape off the top. So you just, you just see images that are connected. And so it's a process that I just made up because it works, it allows me to do what I, what I want to do. 
So in here, for example, in these photographs, and at least in this one, uh, I mean, because you referenced it, you're not changing the f-stops on the on no. your camera at all. No, no, it's that's on that part, auto. No. It's, it's, it's on auto. auto. It's a, it's a yeah, that part doesn't interest me in photography. Mm. It just doesn't. I just don't, I don't, I don't. It doesn't interest me. And once I realized that not just putting it on auto and getting up as close as I can, I put it on the, te the telephoto and zoom up as close as I can. That's all I do, and I press click. Okay. And then I move and click. Right. And then I move and click. You know, this piece, you know, uh, it ended f sooner than I got everything I wanted. And so I was like, damn, you know, because it takes a little while when you're shooting high res to click. Camera's like, okay, hang on, okay, 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 we're ready again. Boom. But when you're shooting this many shots, it's like, damn. But um, at a certain point, I was actually sitting on the stage where the kids are, you see on the right? I was actually sitting on the right side of the stage. So I was looking out at the kids, because I was like, they gave me permission to shoot, and I was like, well, where? I'm standing behind everybody. I was actually way in the back, on the, all the way on the other side. So I was a little nervous, because I'm some stranger. They'd never seen me before, the kids. And I'm going, and I'm sitting on the stage. But after a little while, they totally, they, they stopped looking at me, because it's like, oh, okay, there's a guy there, whatever. And then he's looking around at other stuff. You know, as you, as you notice, there's really only um, she's looking at me smiling. And I started with her because she's my, son, my friend's daughter. And this is why I got the idea to do this piece. Because I've been hanging out with Vladimir, who's a great Cuban artist from uh, Cienfuegos. And um, his daughter came home from school one day and she had her little beret on. And I was like, oh my God. <laughs> so like, I had moved on to another town. I was in uh, Trinidad. And just this idea popped into my head. I was like, oh my God, I should do a portrait of, of uh, Alejandra with her school outfit, like when, she, when she's coming home from school. So I told Vladimir, and he was like, you know what would be better than that is why don't you do a portrait of the whole school? Mm -hmm. I was like, damn, that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. So we had to go to the school and meet the, the director of the school. The, the shorter of the two gentlemen on the stage, he's got a shirt that has all pencils. <laughs> it's adorable, it's oh. adorable. He's been teaching there for like 35 years. He started as a teacher and now he runs a school. And it's the only school in Cuba where they, it's devoted to the teachings of Che and they wear, they, where they wear the beret. And so he really interviewed me. He wanted to know what I was doing, why I was doing it. He wanted to make sure that I wasn't gonna use the photos to try to twist their ethos, to try to paint them in a bad light. And so, you know, Vladimir vouching for me and me talking to him about my feelings about Cuba and showing him the other images that I had because I had finished some pieces before I shot this. He was like, okay, come here tomorrow at 7.15. And I was like, that early? <laughs> and he could do it. <laughs> it's true. Well, and I think that's a really important point because that's sort of what we talked about is you know, you could be perceived as a, a typical gringo yep. who's going to be going there and shooting these very romantic images right. that are in the vein of these travel uh, photographs, right, which are extremely problematic, right? right? Um, and I think, you know, kudos to you that, you know, you're coming from this from a different orientation, so you're developing those social relationships in order to be entering these spaces. Right. Right, so, uh, so those social relationships allow this to happen. Right, right, right. Without true. that, you don't have any of this. Right. right? Is that yeah, it's true, and I, I, didn't, I didn't think about a lot of those issues when I, when I went, and when I came home, I finished the first piece I did was the, the piece at night with the three women. And I, I finished that piece, and I was so happy because after my first trip, I really missed Cuba a ton, and I was... I was longing for it, and so my sister came over, and she looked at it, and she's like, that's a beautiful piece, and you need to do some reading. You know, you need to find out and read about this history of European kind of descended artists who go down to the Caribbean and who portray culture and people down there in, in, a, in a way that's very... Um, about empire and colonialism and stereotypes and projection and that stuff. And so 
I got a list of books from um, Lester Tomei, who's a Cuban uh, dance professor. And he gave me this long list of books, and I took them all out from the Five College Library. And it was really good because one of the books I got was a photography book by an American male white photographer. And it was the worst kind of portrayal you could imagine. And it was, he basically was trying to say, communism sucks, Cuba made a mistake, and look at how bad they're living. And he didn't really say that, but when you look at the images and read the captions, that's what he's saying. And I was like, that is ill. I, I don't want to do that. And so it made me really con more conscious of let this project be about the people I meet, about the converse, about, you know, some travel photography is like you're on a bus or you're walking in India or whatever and you see somebody and you're like, you know, I've seen them a lot. People just take a picture, click, and they keep walking. There's no human connection, so there's no understanding of who is that person, what are they going through, you know, there's no connection. It's almost like you steal an image because it's not, there's no consent, there's no communication. And so with, with these pieces, you know, there's, there's a communication, you know, like those two portraits on the wall back there, on the left and on the right, you know, those are people I, on the right is Nena, I spent two days with her. Um, and so we talked for hours and and so that piece was done actually maybe an hour after I met her, but I feel like she's a part of my circle, my family, you know, and, and this man too, it's like, and I interviewed both of them, and the interviews are on my website. And in the conversation with the man on the left, one of the beautiful things you hear is that he keeps calling me Iko. You know, he's calling me his son. And it's like, it's- Term of endearment. Yeah, and it's like, he just met me, and. And we're talking in a way that he's already like, yo. There's intimacy. Yeah, yeah. He's telling me about his wife, who lives eight hours away by car, how she has um, Parkinson's and she can't hold the phone, so they barely get a chance to talk, how he has to pick up 100 cans to get 40 cents U.S. A hundred cans, and he's 73, I think he said he was. But he's strong, like he's like a little ox, you know? So there's, a, there's an intention of kind of bringing him here. I just want to bring him here, and I want to get out of the way as much as I can. And same with all of these experiences. I really, because of how I feel about Cuba, I want people who see the exhibit to feel that how I feel, and then I want them to want to go, and I want them to go and have their own experience. And that, that's like a great intention, because by going there, you have your own experience, and you make your own connections, and you, you are informed about Cuba based on your experiences, and not based on the things, the propaganda that we've heard, and continue to hear about the Cubans trying to poison our government officials in Havana, and, and you know, I don't know what's going on down there. Who does? Really? You know? But there's a level of trust that is extended and returned that forms the basis of this work. It's not a snapshot and then you walk away. It's someone that you met, that you talked to. And, and that wasn't easy for me in the beginning. I remember when I was in my hotel. I only stayed in a hotel one time. The rest of the time it was in Casa Particular, people's houses with the little room and a little bathroom. And so you. The baby's crying here, like, damn, I'm paying $30, it's not a lot. But I just want to sleep. I just want to sleep, and the baby's crying, but then you're like, you know, well, the baby's crying. The baby will stop crying, you know? <laughs> you are in the family, you know? You're not, like, off on the resort where the, the, the beach is all perfectly combed. And that's boring. I don't want that. I don't want that in Cuba. I, don't, I never go to the, what's the peninsula in, in, where people go to the resort? Varadero. I've never been there. I don't want to go. I don't feel drawn there. There's so many places that I want to go in Cuba, but Varadero's not one. Because I feel like that exists everywhere. That's almost like the, the capitalist idea of, of what they think we want. And some people want that, and I, I'm not going to judge people who want that. Sometimes you just want to lie on a beach. I get that. 
But when you have the opportunity to have the beach and have this level of life and culture and soul and heart, the heart and soul down there is, is un, unmatched. And this, I think this is connected to my next question. So, you know, we talked about, uh, I think this is important. You know, I see the, 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 the mosaic approach, you know, you piecing together uh, this collage of, of multiple photographs here, right? Um, sort of a way in which you piece together, it's the art of survival in, in, Puerto, in, in, in Cuba, right? Also Puerto Rico, yeah. right? But, but, but in this case, right, during the special period, right. you know, in Cuba, it was, it was a hustle, yeah. right? Yeah. So I think there's a congruence between sort of you piecing together these things along right. with the daily struggle of piecing together a daily survival. Yeah, right? definitely. Uh, I'm wondering if you've thought about that. Yeah, and, and it, interestingly that you started with Puerto Rico because with the hurricane, you know, Puerto Rico's going through its own special period, yeah. you know, and, and people are really suffering. And, and the U.S. is connected to that. You know, and so the special period, okay, why did that happen? Okay, so the U.S. empire is connected to that too. Mm -hmm. And so I'm an American. Mm -hmm. And so, okay, what's my role in this? You know, and, you know, you go down there and people are not disposable the way, the way we're treated here. You know, like, like Hampshire, mm -hmm. right? Oh, so the money's not making sense. Okay, you guys got to go, right? And who's making that choice? That's corporate, corporate America, right? Right? That say it's an institution and all that. You think it's going to be there forever. But when it comes down to the money not stacking up, okay, why is the money not stacking up? And why am I responsible for that? When I gave my heart and soul here. And you don't even tell me why you're making that decision or you're making these decisions behind closed doors. And so in Cuba, there's like a level of, you know, what's interesting in Cuba is when you talk to people, they say, we're united. Obviously, that's a little romanticized. But one thing that I've been told is that the special period really brought people together because without those kind of helping each other, then people could have really starved. You know, there, there was malnutrition. There was one guy I asked him about race, and I was like, why, why, why do you think it changed from before, you know, the revolution when people in the country weren't having access to education and, and, and in terms of color, there was a lot less, you know, uh, balance and, and access. And he, he underlined the special period. And, and one interesting thing he said was that the generation in Cuba who's born after the special period, who didn't experience that, he sees a little bit of a change you know how sometimes when you, you're in the States and you like, you might even be walking on the street and you feel this aggression from someone like who won't get out of the way or something when you're walking or something? I just, I never felt that in Cuba, but I felt it once at a club and it was this young kid who was buying this bottle of, of whatever mm -hmm. that out down there, it's like really expensive, you know, it's like $30, but that's like, a lot of money down there. And he had two or three young ladies who were around him and he had that energy of like, and I was shocked because I was like, wow, there it is. I see that all the time up here. But down there is the first time I saw it. And so there is something about that things and people and lives are, 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 you can't just throw them away because what are you gonna, how do you replace that? You can use that to do something else, even if it's you know, melting down a piece of metal from a washing machine to turn it into the bumper. You, know, you talk to people, they, they know how to fix things, they know how to make use of, of virtually everything. You know, in a city as big as Havana, you, you don't see piles of trash you know, because people make use of stuff. You know, there's, there's isn't disposable, there's no reason to throw it out because you can make use of it for using, if you think of it. And I like that here because I'll look at something that's not working. I'm like, ah, I should just throw that out. I'm like, wait a minute, why would I throw that out? I can fix that thing or make use of it or. And this, this is very much, um, you know, in Cuba, it's like, how do you find out how to fix the car? 
It's not like there's a manual or there's a Ford dealer or there's a, a part from 1957. You, you got to find out from somebody in the neighborhood who knows that stuff. When I went over to the house of the musicians, they plugged into this sound system that the neighbor made, and it was the best sound system I ever heard. And it looked like a, a speaker. It wasn't something you found manufactured. He made that thing. But he knew how sound works. He knew how to wire the thing. He knew, he knew how to build a beautiful sounding speaker. And so this is, this is my version. Because no one taught me how to make these things. It's not like I went to school for these things. I saw an image this big in an art book in high school. And it was a David Hockney collage. And it was similar to these. And the second I looked at it, I had this message. I want to do that at some point. I want to do that. Mm -hmm. And when it was finally in my late 30s that I was like, yo, you're, you're almost 40. You've never done that. So if you really want to do that, and you've been thinking about it for 20 years now, what's up? And so finally I, I, I started a piece, and it led to this series that it's all self-taught. It's all... Just learn as you go, which is very much what you find you know, in Cuba. Mm -hmm. uh, along with in Cuba, there's also great schools for training and ballet and fine art, and there's also great teachers there, too. Mm -hmm. And so I did have a great teacher in the beginning who kind of gave me the, the confidence to, to be a beginner, to, to, to make this photography my own in some way. And then this is what came out. You know, there's a, you know, I'm going to go back a little bit to the very beginning, uh, how we started, and that uh, New York is very much a global city. Uh, you know, the constant different languages going around, and we don't feel like foreigners, right? Um, you said something, however, that someone said to you, if you're going to be taking a lot of photographs, you got to, you got to give me some money. Right. You were. You were a foreigner in that moment. Oh, right? yeah, of course. Um, I mean, it's obvious. How did that... How you know, did... it's weird. Like, most of the time in Cuba, obviously, I'm seen as a tourist. But sometimes I'm seen as a Cuban, you know? And so Cuba has this mix of, you know, African, indigenous, and Spanish, where you get the whole gamut of humanity. Um, but I am aware of the fact that, you know, if I'm asking somebody to stand there and, and be a subject in my piece, there's, they're giving me. They're giving me value, and I need, to, I need to recognize that. And so, yeah, I give, I, it's one place I can give a lot of money. A lot, meaning even $100 or $200 or $300 spread out between a bunch of people is a lot of money for people. I remember one time I was in Vinales and I was on a back street and I, was, I did a piece that's not up here, but this particular man is in the piece. But before I shot it, I went up to him and I asked him. I was like, is it okay to do a piece here? He's like, yeah. And I gave him 20, 20 convertible pesos, you know, the tourist dollars. He, he was like, he took it and then he, he went like this. <laughs> yeah, because he was like, I don't want anybody seeing this or asking me about this. You know, and that's another beautiful part about being in Cuba. You know, I remember when we, Manolo was the guy who was the horse, he had the horses, because we, we got to Nana's house by horse. You, you can't really get there by car. You got to go over a river, you got to go, you know. And, um, you know, the, the first time we, we went to this one bar where there was a woman kind of like Nana. She was out in the back working in a kitchen, and, and Manolo, I was like, I would love to photograph her. Manolo was like, uh, you know, Nina, is, you know, if okay, she's like, no way, my hair's not done, I'm not doing that. And we were like, please, please, and she was like, no, go away. And we're like, all right. And then Manola was like, wait, I know somebody. I was like, Nina, she's where I get my, my, uh, my turkeys. Whenever I need turkeys, I go buy them from her. And I was like, do you take tourists there? And he was like, no, nah. because everywhere he wanted to take me, it was like where the tourists go, the waterfall, the this, the cafe. I was like, nah, I don't want to go see that. And finally, we got to Nana. And so, a funny, not funny, a kind of a, a story about Nana was we had such a nice time the first time we went to hang out with her. She was like, you need to come back. I was the first tourist who'd been to her place in 60 years. 
60 years. No one had ever been to her farm. She had worked in sugarcane as a teenager out in the sun. And a friend of hers had loaned her some money and she was able to start by buying a few animals. And over the years, she built a livestock business and bought a big piece of land where she raised her five kids. And so now she's in her late 70s. And um, we had such a nice visit when I was there with her. She was like, you should come back and we should have a meal. And I was like, that sounds amazing. And so they were going to slaughter a goat and to cook just for that meal. OK, so one thing about Cuba and me is that like the digestive situation <laughs> It's always issues down there. The, the diet's different, the, 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 the whatever. The, the Cubans are used to what is down there, and I'm not. And so I was not far from the bed for about a day after I hung out with Nana. <laughs> <laughs> and it was like, I'm like, am I going to freaking get on a horse and ride an hour and a half like this? That would be dangerous <laughs> and very uncomfortable. It's sort of like, Manolo, how do we tell Nana that I'm not coming? Sorry, you know, and so I called Manolo at night because I was like, I'm supposed to go the next morning. And I called Manolo, I was like, Manolo, there's no way I'm going to make it out there tomorrow. I'm really sorry. And he was like, okay, okay, I'll call, I'll call Nana tomorrow morning first thing. But he called Nana, but because of how long it takes to prepare a slaughtered goat by hand, they had already killed the goat. Now, killing a goat is like, it's a big deal. You know, it's, it's something she could have sold. It's, it's, it's her, you know, it's part of her wealth. So I felt horrible, as you can imagine. But I, I, I felt like I made the right choice. And then I said to Manolo, you know, we got to go back out there. We, you can't just, I'm going to leave Cuba and leave Nana hanging like that. So we went back out there. And when we got to Nana's property, we rode up the hill. And she saw us coming. And she walked right into the kitchen. She was pissed, you know? She felt disrespected. And, and, and so I had to, you know, I had to crawl over to the kitchen and, and just lay it out there to her, you know? I just said, Nana, you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm so sorry. There's nothing in the world I wanted to do more than have this meal with you. But this is what happened. And I told her. And she, she got over it. She totally got over it. She was like, oh, OK, all right. So we hung out for a couple more hours. And then I hope, I hope to enjoy that meal at some point with her, you know? <laughs> uh, <laughs> That's real, man. Yeah. That is real. Yeah. Um, I'm looking at the clock. So Where are we? Yeah, we're, we're about, uh, yeah, I'm going to open it oh, up. Oh, yeah. So yeah, let's so do it. Let's open let's it up. Do that. Um, uh, so I'm going to open up the floor right now. Thank you, Mark. And so, yeah. Uh, wow. So uh, shoot away if you have any questions. If you could stand, that would help too. Uh, any questions? Any questions? Or comments? Or? Yeah. I was wondering how you, if you could tell us a little bit about making your first. And you raise your voice. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about making the first piece. Yeah, so the first piece, the first trip, I used a film camera. And I went to CVS because I still hadn't figured out where I should get these things developed. Because I was using film, I didn't shoot as many as I use now with digital. So this, I think, was actually, no. This was shot with my phone. Yeah. So we became friends about uh, maybe four or five days into my trip. I was at a dance club, Dancing Salsa. And one of the dance teachers was, was standing dancing with two women. And he saw me. And he was like, hey, come here. And I was like, what? He's like, I need you to dance with her. And I was like, OK. And so he, he paired me up with Don Ice. And so we danced, and we became friends with the dance teacher, with Don Ice, and with uh, Yannette, who was there as well, and Shakira. And so we started, you know, they became friends with our traveling group, and we went out dancing more. We went to the beach. And so this was my last night in Santiago. And so they just came over to say goodbye. And this is on the roof of the Casa Particular where I was staying. And I had told them about this project because I had just started it like the day before. And I was asking them, would you guys want to be part of it? Would you, want, would you be 
willing to do a portrait? And they were like, yeah. And so I had forgotten about it by this time. And so they were like, so what's up with the portrait? And I was like, you want, you, you want to do it? And they were like, yeah, 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 come on, let's go, let's do it. So I was like, OK. So I ran downstairs, I got my camera, I came upstairs, and, and I don't have a flash on that camera, the, the film camera. So I'm like, I can't do it. And I was like, wait a minute, what if I use my phone? So I took out my phone, and I just, you know how you can get the, as close as you can with the phone? So I just did that. And if you get up close, even from far away, you can see how pixelated it is. But I'm so glad that the phone enabled me to capture this moment. This is the only piece where actually kind of like they asked for a little direction. They were like, well, what, how should we be? Well, you know, this is also the only piece where I took the four by six and I cut it in four squares. And so you see how each of the squares is like two by three. Because for whatever reason, I was going to try to make more texture. Because it's the same real angle, it, it's, you know, it's, it still seems like one image. But I really like, for instance, this, these details down here, I thought are really important. You know, I wanted you to see the cell phone, the cigarettes, the, you know, the yellow part, like all this stuff is important. The Jamaica kind of like colors here. Anyone else? Any other questions? Oh. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad that you raised the whole idea of taking, even the language of taking photos, yeah. right? Yep. So here's this, you know, this incredible piece um, these ones specifically to people that you have relationships with, do they go back? Do you know, the pieces they, go back? Do these pieces, right, like, I, I mean, I can imagine a school loving this piece of themselves reflecting back. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and I also see that, you know, it's a mosaic, it's kind of a big piece of this is my inability to be so close to it, to read it, and, you know, the actual experience, that third space you were talking about. So just wondering, what's the relationship now of these pieces to the people that... I mean, the goal, is, the goal is to bring the exhibit there, to definitely show it in Cuba. I had two invitations to really nice galleries, one in Cienfuegos and one in Trinidad. And I called it off at the last minute because of... It was right about the time when people were getting stranded and the travel ban was put in place. And I was like just imagining me getting separated from all the work. And it was going to be a monumental effort to roll these things up and put them in the right size containers and then get on a plane. And it's not so easy to, to get around in Cuba. You know, even if you have the money, it it's, can be, you know, it can be a little bit challenging. And so to have this body of work with me at that particular time, it didn't feel like the right time. But I do feel like it's not complete until it does go back there, because I feel like they need to see it. And I've shown it to a bunch of people over there, and, and it made me very happy to see the response, you know, um, both from the galleries and from, a, from artists, some artists' friends over there, whose work I really admire. And so when I kind of got that feedback from Cubans themselves, that really made me happy. Plus, here's a Cubana right here, and she, she saw the show in Boston. And so I'm curious what it's like for you to see this stuff. Um, yeah? yeah. Mm. That's, That's nice. There's nowhere like home. It's true. Because they have. Ah. They are um, the different because it's a collage. I've never seen this before. Mm -hmm. I've seen a lot of pictures. When people take pictures about Cuba, it's most most of them are sad. Sad. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ah. So the pictures and do one crime. Wow. This is different. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, the suffering in Cuba is real. You know, there's no way around it. 
But the joy and the love and soul and heart in Cuba is real as well. And it's, it's, it's undeniable. It's off the charts. If you had a measurement, it would be like ding, 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 ding. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? Lee. Yeah, I was just wondering about your sense of freedom. When you were taking this picture, you were talking about the freedom in these places, I wonder, because like you mentioned, you said that you wanted us to be there when you're doing these collages. So I wanted to know, not only, I wanted to know your, your sense of freedom when you're there. How do you perceive freedom? Yeah. I mean, one thing I love about Cuba is that I don't have a plan when I start the day usually. You know, I can eat breakfast and go out the door and just kind of see where the day takes me. Obviously, I'm on vacation. I got plenty of money. So that affects how my freedom is. And the plenty of money thing is about my dollars being so powerful down there so that I can live in a way that I can't really live here. Okay, so that's part of the equation. Um, like in Puerto Rico, I'm not going to have the same kind of freedom, you know, because it's more expensive. But for instance, one day I was walking in Trinidad and I walked by this, the houses are right on the street kind of, you know? So like if the, if the window grates are open, you're looking right into somebody's living room. So a lot of times they're closed or people are there sitting on the stoop. It's very close, right? So I walk by this one window, and there's, there's a young man sitting in the window, and an arm reaches out with a glass of rum. <laughs> and I'm a, I'm a New Yorker, so I'm like, hell no, I'm not drinking that. <laughs> Are you crazy? It's like spiked with something, you know? But my intuition was like, it's fine. Have a freaking drink. <laughs> so I was like, all right, thank you. So I had a sip, and the guy started talking to me, Two hours later, I'm hanging out with his, it was his brother's birthday, and the, these five young guys, all in the same family, they like do signs for businesses and hotels and stuff. They show me the back of the house where they're putting on two more bedrooms. He's like, this is your room the next time you come. <laughs> I, don't, I don't say that to nobody. Even in my own family. It's like you get one night in that bed and you're out. <laughs> but like, that's the kind of thing where I had no plan to have that experience. And it's like, where you can't buy that experience, you know? And the guy showing me their, their art, you know? And oh, you're an artist? Well, here's these are the signs we make. Let us show you our work. And, and then it's his, the, the guy's birthday, so they're singing. And you know, it's like uh, 2 p.m. on a Thursday. You know, and so it's like, for me, that's freedom, you know, that kind of experience, it's, it's magical and, and free. You know, those guys were real free and open with me. And, you know, it wasn't a situation where they were trying to get something from me. You know what I mean? You got to always be on the lookout for that stuff because people have needs, you know, and they know I got money. But once you get your antenna right, and you're listening to your intuition, then you can find those kind of experiences. And they're everywhere, in Cuba especially. Thank you guys for coming. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>